Consider supporting me on Patreon to see my videos a day early and receive other fun perks. Out of all the bad games that exist in the world, most of them are not worth playing. I know, what a shock. Oftentimes, if a game is bad, it's a cheap, generic mess with virtually no value to it whatsoever. But then you have that rare breed of bad game, the interestingly bad ones. Games that, even though they're clearly not good, you can still get something out of playing them. Whether it's elements that did really well in spite of everything else failing, or the game just failing in interesting ways. This tends to manifest in things like laughably bad writing, or the game being so flooded with glitches that you can have fun breaking it. But then there's the actual design decisions. Surely there's no ironic enjoyment to be had from gameplay mechanics and level designs that work as intended, right? That's what I thought for a while, until I played Conker's Bad Fur Day. Now, I know I'm attacking a classic here, but let's be real. The gameplay isn't why this game is so beloved. People loved it, and still love it to this day, because it's a raunchy parody of your typical cutesy 3D platformer, which makes people more willing to overlook the many bad design choices present in this game. While I obviously would've preferred it if the game was good, I have to admit, I got a good deal of enjoyment from just how bad things could get. There was plenty of frustration involved, but a sick, twisted part of me forced myself to keep going. I had to see what new and exciting ways the game would find to piss me off. And believe me, I found plenty. Due to all that, this video is going to be structured a bit differently from my other reviews. Rather than talking about different elements of the game separately, I'm gonna go through the events of the game in order and give my thoughts, and I'll bring up more general points of the game whenever it fits. You start off with the opening level. Hungover. It's a simple tutorial that gets you acquainted with the controls and introduces the context-sensitive panels, which are a really clever system that I'd like to see more games try. I will say that it took me a while to figure out I could use the frying pan everywhere, but I'll chalk that one up to me not experimenting enough. This level also introduced me to one of my pet peeves with the platforming in this game. You see, Conker doesn't immediately come to a complete stop. He slides a bit. It isn't a huge amount, but it's just enough for it to cause problems for me. I actually had a lot of trouble getting past this level because I would always move too far on the platforms, miscalculating when Conquer would come to a stop. This issue doesn't come into play that often, but it's always a pain when it does. Once you finish the tutorial, you get introduced to the Panther King and one of my biggest problems with the game's story. Now, don't get it twisted. I like how dumb of a villain the Panther King is. It honestly fits really well with the tone this game is trying to create. My problem is despite all the introduction scenes we get with him, he has basically no impact on the story for most of the game, aside from the game over cutscenes. Hell, Conker doesn't even know he exists until right before the final battle. Like, if you weren't going to have him do anything, why would you spend so much time building him up? It seems like such a waste. Then we make it to the hub world, Wendy. This hub world is weird because sometimes they'll have you perform a bunch of different tasks to open up a level, and sometimes they won't. Feels really random. Opening up this level is pretty simple. Just go get the Queen Bee's hive back from the wasps, shoot some guys, and you're on to the first real level, Barn Boys. This one is unique for this game because its design feels more open, like something out of Banjo, despite the objectives being pretty linear, just like everything else in this game. The first thing you need to do is feed this rat three pieces of cheese so he'll explode and this guy's wife will get off him. To do this, you have to get cheese from the cheese corral and carry it to the rat. Now, in most games with an objective like this, they would have you getting the cheese from different places or changing the environment in some way. But this game was creative and decided to just have you do the exact same thing three times. Same route, same obstacles, no differences. Yay! Now you can get into the barn and trick Frankie into destroying all the hay bales. After that, Frankie's friends give him such a hard time that he tries to kill himself. But since he's a pitchfork and doesn't have a neck, he's okay. Then we pull a lever and see what's become of King B. Turns out he left his wife to pollinate his sunflower waifu. However, in order to get her in the mood, you need to find five swarms of pacifist bees to tickle her and get her to show off her goods. Now, the bees re set when you die, which is perfectly reasonable and wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for my second issue with the platforming in this game, the fall damage. Now, I'll be perfectly frank, I don't like fall damage in platformers at all. I'm cool with it in games like A Hat in Time where they make mitigating it part of the fun, but for the most part, it just feels like an arbitrary way of restricting your movement and slowing you down. And Conker has it bad. 
probably the worst I've seen. It's astounding just how short of a distance he can fall and still take damage. And falls that would amount to maybe one unit of damage in other games are enough to kill him instantly. Most of the levels are at least designed around this, but the problem is really apparent in this level because it's so open. Anyway, you get all the bees and take advantage of Miss Sunflower's assets to get up to some money. Needless to say, I spent a lot of time on this part because it's actually really hard. Despite the size of her chlorophyll milkies, the hitbox on them is surprisingly really small. And not only do you have to get a bounce on them, but you have to do it multiple times in a row to get high enough to nab the money. Not only that, but it bounces you to the side, so you have to aim and hit her tiny hitbox all over again. Plus, simply hitting them isn't enough. You also have to hit the jump button when you do in order to gain more height. Now, the timing on that is forgiving enough, but the game never tells you that you have to do this. And considering how hard it is to get consecutive bounces, it'll probably be a while before you figure that out. I guess the devs were just really proud of the jiggle physics they gave her and wanted you to spend as much time as possible admiring them, which more power to you if you're into that, but you can also come back and do this whenever, so there's no need to make it take this frustratingly long. Anyway, now you go back into the barn, cut Frankie down, and ride on him to defeat this big hay man. The controls are a bit awkward, but nothing too bad. After poking him a few times and making him go Terminator on you of all things, you get knocked down to the basement and his identity as the hay bot is revealed, leading to the first boss in the game. One of the best things I could say about Conker's gameplay is that the boss lineup is pretty good. They're a lot of fun at best, and a little frustrating, but not too bad at worst. My only complaint with this one is that I really don't think it should have been the first boss. It's not too hard, but with the altered controls that Frankie gives you, and a somewhat complicated way of damaging him by getting him to shoot a pipe, luring him over to it, and then using Frankie to hit a button on his back, I don't think he's the best introduction to the game's bosses, especially when there's a much easier boss later on. Anyway, you beat the hay bot, but Frankie gets gets broken in the process. Luckily, Conker has some tape to fix him up. This is gonna sound weird, but I was more emotionally invested in Frankie than any other character in the game. He goes from being bullied by painting tools and attacking Conker out of peer pressure to befriending Conker after he shows him a bit of kindness. I know it sounds weird, but I honestly found myself caring about this weird hillbilly pitchfork and his character arc. I felt legitimately sad when he got broken in half, and then relieved when Conker put him back together. Anyway, he leaves, and you have to escape from the basement as the water rises while cutting down any loose wires that could electrocute you. This segment is pretty tense and fun. Yeah, it can be a pain when you miss a wire and die because of it, but that's not really the game's fault. Finally, the level ends with you climbing to the top of a massive ladder and smashing into a giant wooden bucket. Bit of an odd way to end the level, but so be it. Overall, Barn Boys was a good level. It's a bit basic, and there were some frustrating moments, but overall, it was a good time. I really liked the idea it set up of progressing by doing some of the most insane, raunchy, and violent things possible, yet somehow helping out the people around you by doing those things. If the game stayed like this and kept the frustrating elements to a minimum, it could have been a really good time, but... You know, that didn't happen. Speaking of which, we're delving into the real crap now with Bat's Tower. Technically, there's some stuff in the hub world you have to do first, but I'm gonna save that for later because it feels more like part one of a later level. Anyway, Bat's Tower centers around these catfish who need you to help them get money from their safe. In order to do that, you need to restrain the bullfish, and in order to do that, you need the help of this gear named Carl. First things first, you need to climb up this tower with really narrow walkways while Bat's attacked. You. Now, that sounds like a pain in the ass, but it's surprisingly painless. This is because, with the exception of the first one, you don't actually have to walk across these walkways. Your hover lasts long enough to let you skip each one and grab onto the next rope. The problem comes in when you make it to the top. You need to get the money by jumping across the top of the tower and avoiding the enemies. The main problem here is depth perception. There are a few points in the game, like with Lady Flower Tresco earlier, where it's tough to judge Conquest depth in relation to everything else, and it's especially bad here since these platforms are narrow and curved slightly. So combined with the slipping, it's really hard to make sure Conker lands where he's supposed to. Now, you might be thinking, can I just adjust the camera? And oh boy do I wish you could. You see, now we're on to pet peeve number three, 
the camera. You see, the camera on Conker's Bad Fur Day is pretty good considering it's an early 3D game, but it has a few major flaws. For starters, you can't adjust it vertically, which doesn't come up too often, but when it does, it can be a pain. More importantly though, the camera can't move inside walls, which means if Conker's near a wall, it's gonna be hard to get a view of the other side of the room. And since the edges of the tower are counted as walls, you can't adjust the camera to see the platforms better or even look for the money you have to collect. This isn't the only time where the camera declares war on you, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Anyway, after pulling the lever at the top of the tower, you open up the area where the other cogs are hiding, knock them out, and deliver them back to Carl. Not much to say gameplay-wise, but I felt really dirty doing this from a story perspective. I do not want to think about the implications of what being a gear means in this world. At least Carl gets his comeuppance and the Lady Cogs are set free in the end, so I guess everything's okay. It's still super icky, though. Feel free to hang on to that feeling of disgust, by the way. You'll need it soon. Our next task is to open up the vault via a needlessly complicated puzzle. You have to hit the right letters when they appear through the hole in that big wheel thing. The problem is the hole is relatively small and the aiming is really imprecise. You don't have a reticle, so you have no way of knowing where your shot is going to go without testing it first, and given how loose these aiming controls are, it really feels like a guessing game. But if you thought that was bad, you haven't seen anything yet, because now we're on to the Clang's Lair, easily the the worst segment in the game. It legitimately feels like it was engineered to be as bad as possible. First off, it's a water level, already off to a terrible start. Now, the swimming controls in Conquer aren't that bad, but they aren't that good either. What's worse is that for some godforsaken reason, the scenery squashes and stretches while you're underwater like Conquer's on drugs or something. This doesn't factor into the gameplay too much, but it's still really unpleasant to look at, especially when going through a long corridor. Of course, since this is a water segment, you have an air meter to deal with. And this air meter is not nice. I swear, the second room gives you just barely enough time to make it to the surface. One mistake and you're taking damage. And that damage peels off fast. And as if one timer hanging over your head wasn't enough, you also have your headlamp to deal with. I don't think you actually need to keep it on, but it's still weird they strapped you with this thing. On top of all that, this place is a maze. Not a particularly complicated maze, it's got like four rooms, but it's still a pain. And just to make things even worse, I haven't even gotten to the titular clangs. These are the robotic fish that swim around and attack you if you get in their way. The worst part about them is their paths involve going through the tunnels that connect the rooms, and they're about as big as said tunnels. So if one of them shows up in the tunnel you're in, you're taking damage unless you're lucky and really close to the edges, which isn't always something you can afford to worry about because of the air meter. Again, you don't have to do that much in the labyrinth. Just go down the tunnel, make it to the second room, go to the room with the lever, back to the second room, then to the final room to swim out. But considering how same me everything looks, how slowly you move, and how easy it is to die, you're gonna get lost a lot. This segment can probably be beaten in 10 minutes, but it took me around 40 and felt like an hour. It's that bad. If you want to vent your frustrations on the world after that awful segment, well, you can. That is, if you're relieved stressed by pissing on people. That's right, this next part is all about pissing on these little fire imps. Yeah, this might be a good time to mention that I knew about all the big stuff that happened in Conquer before playing, which doesn't ruin my enjoyment with a lot of games, but it really does hurt Conquer since so much of the game relies on shock value. Like, I probably would have found this segment funny if I didn't know about it beforehand. But as is, it's just kind of annoying. I could talk more in depth about the pissing controls, but believe it or not, there's a better time to do that than right now. Anyway, the last two imps hop inside the boiler and the next boss fight begins. Yeah, even if I didn't know about this guy beforehand, I still don't think I would have found his joke funny. It's just too weird and immature. The fight is at least good though. You wait for the boiler to stand on one of the drains, then pull the lever to dump an unknown substance on him and go in for the kill. Do this several times and you're done. This fight is really easy. The platforms with the levers above them are elevated and protect you from the boiler's attacks, minus the fire, which is easy to dodge. Combine that with the simple, obvious solution of how to beat him, and I think he would have made a much better first boss than the Haybot. I mean, thematically he wouldn't, but gameplay-wise, this dude is a much better introduction. Anyway, you use his balls to solve a puzzle, which I'll admit was kind of funny due to how bizarre it was, and see your reward for all of this was a whole $10. Luckily, you get more than 
that after this bullfish takes out the trash in a fairly easy and pretty cathartic chase sequence. And then you're done. Yeah, no way around it, that level sucked. Clang's Lair was absolute hell, and even if you ignore it, the rest of the level has a lot of frustrating moments with only a handful of fun stuff to balance it out. All right, next up is Pooh Mountain and the hub world activities leading up to it. Not sure we needed this much content about poop, but at least we got a good level out of it. It starts when you enter a dung beetle's cabin and need to get the poo flowing. To do this, you first need to climb through this cavern area. The platforming here is actually pretty solid, but it's seriously held back by the camera, making things way more difficult than they need to be. Then you get to this segment where you have to get on a bowl, ram into a couple of these cows to get them to drink prune juice, shit their brains out, and then make them fucking explode. The controls on the bowl are a bit tricky, but not in a bad way. This segment's actually pretty fun, if a bit frustrating. I will say though, maybe the internet has ruined me, but I think the whole scene of the cow shitting has aged really weirdly. I'm sure back then the typical response was, ew, gross, poop. Well, nowadays it's more like, wow, I am witnessing someone's fetish right now. I really feel like I shouldn't be here. Anyway, you complete this task, teach Conker to swim underwater, or under shit in this case, and you're given infinite poo balls from the dung beetle, which you push up Pooh Mountain to open both it and Bat's tower. And there is something weirdly satisfying about pushing this thing up the mountain. The controls are surprisingly good and seeing it grow bigger and bigger before crushing your enemies is pretty nice. Then of course, there's the inside of Pooh Mountain. You go in, knock out a few pieces of sweet corn, deliver them to the mysterious voice while avoiding the massive poop hands reaching around and you know what happens next. Yeah, it's time for the most famous moment in the game, the Great Mighty Pooh. Now, for all of my complaints about overexposure, you'd think that it would have hit this fight the hardest of all. After all, it's the most famous fight in the game, and I've been listening to Slifrano for over a decade at this point. Any and all shock value has been wrung out of this fight. But that's the thing. Take away the shock value, and what are you left with here? A great song and a pretty solid boss fight. Pun intended. I remember when I first played No More Heroes 2, and despite hearing Philistine dozens of times, it still felt special when fighting Mario. Margaret, and yeah, the same principle largely applies here. The song really does add to the feel of the fight, as does the setting. There's something weirdly epic about this room filled with crap. As for the actual gameplay here, it's simple yet effective. You have to avoid the poo balls and throw rolls of toilet paper into the great mighty Pooh's mouth. The interesting part is that there is a little bit of strategy here. You can stay on top of the context sensitive panel the whole time and use your toilet paper to fend off the poo balls, which is hard to do and makes you a sitting duck, or you can move around, making it less likely you'll take damage, but also making it so you'll take up time running back to the panel when he starts singing. You also don't know which side he's going to appear from, and he moves quick enough that you might not be able to face him in time to hit him with the toilet paper. Luckily, he gives you plenty of tries before he goes back to assaulting you with scat. My only real complaint with this fight is this jump right here. It's so wide, you just barely have enough jumping range to make it across, which is a death sentence when you need to think fast and can kill you near the end of the fight, forcing you to go all the way back to the beginning. Aside from that, this fight is great. Ironic how the giant pile of fecal matter is somehow the least shitty thing in the game. Although I gotta say, why does Conker feel the need to wear a gas mask when he's outside of Pooh Mountain, but not when he's inside it fighting a literal pile of feces? Dude has some weird priorities. Now you would think that after such a great boss fight, the next part would be at least good right? Nope. You have to swim through this tunnel with spinning blades in it, and if you so much as graze one of them, you die instantly. It's like the game realized I was having too much fun and sent this here to punish me. Then immediately afterward, we get the scene where Conker fools these two guards, and I'm not gonna lie, I laughed harder at this than anything else in the game, despite there not really being anything inappropriate about it. Well, aside from this guy shitting in the background. And that's kind of a consistent pattern here. The game's got family guy syndrome. Despite selling itself on its raunch, the funny jokes are usually the PG ones. Funny how that works out. And with that, we're on to the next level. Ugga bugga. Like, immediately. We don't even return to the hub world. The level starts off simple enough. Climb to the top of this temple and ground pound it till it collapses. Then, you're put in the middle of what seems to be a border between two warring factions. The cavemen and the rock people. Getting into the rock people's nightclub is a 
no-go, so push one of them through the border to break open the cave people's temple. Then you hatch a baby dinosaur, have it eat a bunch of cave people, and sacrifice it. And man, the AI on this dinosaur is annoying. It's not too bad in the first part, but it gets really annoying when you have to lead this thing up onto the sacrificial altar without it getting stuck on a corner, and then get off the altar without the dino following you so you can crush it. If you can figure out how the AI works, it's not too bad, but you shouldn't have to figure that out. It should just work. Anyway, this awakens the statue, and you have to get on top of it and make it sneeze so you can get inside. Traversing the statue is short, but weirdly fun, and leads to you finding a hat that makes you the god of these cave people, I guess. This comes with the drawback of hearing their annoying chanting, but at least now you can declare war on the rock people. It took me a while to realize you need to hit them with your frying pan in addition to the cave people attacking them, otherwise they won't die, but that's not a big deal, just a little confusing. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's been a while since we've had something really bad come up. I really need something to make my blood boil. Well, don't worry, the rock people's golden shower extravaganza has you covered. In order to rescue Barry from the cage she's in, the pissing mechanic makes its triumphant return. And holy crap, does it make this segment way harder than it needs to be. Okay, so you need to piss on three different rock guys to get them through three different doorways, and there's a number of things that complicate this whole process. For starters, they're not always in the right spot, so you you need to wait for them to stand in front of the right doorway to piss on them. You also need to make sure Conker is in just the right place to piss on them too. He can't be right on top of them because they'll hit him, but he has to be close enough to piss them all the way into the doorway in one stream because Conker can't move while pissing, and if you try to, the time it'll take Conker to zip up will be enough for the rock guy to come out of boulder form and hit you, undoing all the progress you just made. It also doesn't help that the pissing controls are pretty imprecise, but even if you succeed, your progress might just get set back anyway, because for the first rock guy, you need to roll him across the upper balcony while avoiding the go-go dancers that'll push him off. Also, the walkways are so narrow that stopping to wait for the dancers at the wrong time can also lead to you just accidentally pushing the guy off anyway. And as if all that wasn't enough, Conker doesn't have an infinite stream of piss. For every rock guy you push into a doorway, you then have to use up all your piss, then stumble up onto the platform so you can cure your hangover. And holy hell is Conker agonizingly slow when he's hung over. Sure, you could probably piss on the second and third rock man without going through that song and dance, but do you really want to risk running out of piss in the process? I don't think so. Then Don Weasel has you blow up the caveman's home by lighting a bomb and then having you carry it instead of just trusting you to light it when you get there. Not gonna lie, this part was kind of fun. I heard that the time limit was really unforgiving, but I managed to beat it on my second try, and that one death I had wasn't from the time limit. It was the fact I fell off the platform in the cave entrance, thinking that would save me time instead of killing me. What is unforgiving, though, are these sinking platforms. They sink way too fast, and combine that with the way Conker reacts when touching lava, it's really hard to recover if you fall in, so you'll probably die even at full health. Then we get to the jetboard race, which seems to be one of the most heavily praised moments in the game. I both agree and disagree with this consensus. Let me explain. The action here is fast paced and fun, and the idea of catching up to these guys who just mugged you is pretty cool. There's just one problem. Well, two if you count the gate changing at the end, since you likely won't see it until it's too late. But that's not a huge deal. The big problem is that freaking dinosaur. At two points in the track, a dinosaur will periodically cross through. It feels like RNG what point it'll be at when you get to it, and depending on its position, avoiding it can range from pretty simple to borderline impossible if its legs are front and center. This wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the fact that if you hit the dino head on, you die instantly. And while you can slow down to get the dino into a better position, A, it doesn't help much, and B, you don't want to slow down in a segment like this because you need to catch the muggers in order to win. It's a shame, really. If it weren't for that dinosaur, this would be a pretty fun sequence, but as is, it somehow manages to be really fun and genuinely horrible at the same time. It's weird. Finally, you make it to a coliseum and hypnotize a raptor into letting you ride it and use it to eat a bunch of cavemen, giving you practice for this level's boss. Bug of the nut. What's that? You thought pissing was the only genital-related mechanic being brought back from Bat's Tower here? Oh no, we've got another boss that you beat by hitting it in the balls. And I don't know why, but it's way funnier here. Maybe it's because the boiler was too weird, or maybe it's the idea of this dude's junk getting eaten by a dinosaur, but you gotta laugh out of me every time I dance 
damaged him. The comedic timing is really good here. And once you do that, I will eat your ass. That might just be the most gruesome thing in this game. Like, ouch. As for the fight gameplay wise, it's pretty standard, but also fun. The raptor controls well and avoiding Bugga's attacks works well enough. After a heartfelt goodbye to his murder buddy and trying to cheat on his girlfriend with big titty cave waifu, Conker makes his way back to the hub world and that's Ugga Bugga. Most of the level is fine, but there are some really frustrating segments and the good moments aren't especially good. Before making it to the next level, Conker has to complete the two worst segments in the entire hub world. First off, the queen bee's lost her hive again, and getting it back isn't going to be so simple this time. Now you have to go back into the wasp's lair to get it back, and before you can carry it out, you have to use it to shoot down all of the wasps coming to stop you. The main thing you need to know here is that Conker's first person aiming controls are super clunky, which makes this fight a pain, especially with how many wasps there are and how much they move around. Anyway, you get the hive back and have to make it up the hill in the center so you can pay to roll on this barrel guy. By the way, all the money you've been collecting this entire time is for this one roadblock. The levels don't have money in them after this with one exception, and he asks for all the money you could have possibly gotten at this point. So I hope you didn't miss any. Now, that's not really an issue, it just feels a bit weird. What is an issue is these freaking worms. These things are the most annoying enemies in the game. They come out of nowhere, they're really hard to avoid, they'll often throw you off the hill, and their animation takes forever. So it's just constantly rubbing in your face that they got you. The only way to consistently avoid them is to move really slowly so you see them before you run into them. Because that's fun, right? Being forced to tiptoe around? Anyway, getting the barrel guy's help lets you squash all of these worms and open up the next level. Spooky. The level begins with you meeting up with Greg the Grim Reaper again. Well, I assume it's again. It would be pretty impressive if you hadn't met him yet because that would mean not having died once up to this point. Anyway, he gives you a shotgun and tells you to go to town on the zombies. Maybe I'm just an idiot, but I had to look at a walkthrough just to figure out how to use this thing. But once I got it figured out, mowing down the undead was pretty fun. The kick to the shotgun and seeing the zombies' heads explode is pretty satisfying. Also, I'm curious as to whether the devs actually intended for you to stand on the gravestones to kill these guys, because doing so is a bit awkward, but at the same time, it's freaking impossible to beat them otherwise. There are so many of them and they come at you so fast. Once you beat these guys, you're rewarded with the worm segment again, but even worse. This time, the path is so narrow that if they catch you, you will get thrown off. It's miserable. Going slow is your only option here. Thankfully, once you get to the Haunted Mansion, things get better. Count Batula, a very obvious reference to Count Bleck from Super Paper Mario, turns you into a bat and forces you to bring him villagers and dump them into his gigantic meat grinder so he can feast off of their blood. Not gonna lie, this segment is pretty fun. The controls take some getting used to, but once you get used to them, they work pretty well. The villagers provide a reasonable challenge here. If you get killed, it's likely because you were being reckless and trying to pick off a villager when there were others nearby. Plus, the mansion is the perfect size for something like this and has a memorable layout. The best part, though, is the music. You see, Conker's Bad Fur Day only really has three music tracks that are particularly noteworthy. The Overworld theme, Slafrano, and this one. In fact, I think this is probably the best track in the game. It's just really epic. Anyway, once you feed Count Cannoli enough villagers, he gets too fat and falls into his meat grinder. Conker turns back to normal, and now you have to escape the mansion while dealing with all the zombies coming for you. This part is pretty good overall. The zombies are spaced farther apart than last time, so you have a better shot at killing them, and it's nice to explore this mansion you spent the last segment flying through. There are a few problems, though. For starters, you're screwed if the zombies get you up against a wall, but not for the reason you think. When you're backed against a wall, the camera starts going crazy, making it hard to aim. And since your mobility options are limited when you have the gun out, running isn't much of an option either. Yeah, you can put the gun away, but that's hard to do with the zombies biting you. Then there's the issue with the keys. You see, you have to pick up three keys and take them to the front of the mansion while avoiding the zombies. The problem is that for the last key, there's a really nasty beginner's trap. There's a door you need to open to carry the key through, and while the lever to open it shows up before the key, you can easily miss it. And if you pick up the key before noticing the door is closed, you're screwed because you can't put it down. 
Or at least, I couldn't figure out how to. So I killed myself to get rid of it and start over, but that reset my progress with all three keys. And considering how long this segment is, that really pissed me off. Especially since it took me a while to realize it reset all three keys. As a result, there was a lot of frustration involved when I played this segment. Which is honestly a shame, because I think I would like it if I replayed it, since the layout of the mansion is interesting, and killing the zombies is pretty satisfying. Now, when I finished that part, I thought I was done with the level. But then I realized the worms are still there, and there's a barrel right by the exit, and oh god, we're really doing this. I don't think I need to explain why this segment is crushingly difficult. You can just see it. Look at this. Does this look fun to play? I Trust me, it's not. After riding the barrel all the way back to the first level of all places, you're immediately called over to the next level. It's war. It's War is easily the worst level in the entire game, and from what I've heard, that's a pretty uncontroversial take. You see, this is by far the longest level in the game, and very few of the segments are fun. Not only that, but most of the bad segments don't even have the decency to be bad in interesting ways. They're just generic, samey, poorly designed, and there's way too many of them. Nothing in this level is as bad as Clang's Lair, but the absolute marathon of bullshit they throw at you is enough to wear anyone down. So let's get into it. To start with, before you can even get to the war part of this level, you need to clear the way for the ship. To do this, you first need to restore power to the base by swimming in the water and getting electric eels to follow you underneath the wires. Despite how horrible that sounds, it's not actually that bad. What is really bad is actually blowing up the plane blocking the way. You have to push guys with TNT strapped to their backs to both sides of the plane and detonate them. And of course, both pads you need to take are packed to the brim with obstacles that will kill them in one hit, forcing you to go back and get another one. Pushing these guys isn't exactly precise either. They'll take a few steps after you stop pushing, so if you stop just short of an obstacle, they'll walk into it and die. Now, the course on the left isn't too bad, aside from everything I just mentioned. It's a bit tricky, but ultimately, the movements of the obstacles are slow, predictable, and easy to navigate if you're being careful. As for the right side, it's a literal minefield where the mines won't be visible until you're close to them, so you have to be really careful. Also, some of the gaps between these mines are absurdly tight, so good luck pushing this guy between them. Seriously, the pushing controls were fine in other settings, but they are not equipped for this level of precision. Anyway, you clear the way, get knocked out, and are moved to the main part of this level, the war. Make a quick dash through the war zone, and you're introduced to the main mechanic of this level, the guns. Now, these guns are fine. They're basically the shotgun from Spooky, but rapid fire. This already makes them less fun since the shotgun made you actually think about your shots, but that's not a big deal. The big problem is that the shooting in this level in general, not just these guns, but other forms of shooting as well, seriously overstays its welcome. In Spooky, you only really had two segments where you used the shotgun. One was really short, and the other was a lot longer, but also mixed things up and didn't have you shooting the whole time. What does this level do? Well, after clearing out a room full of teddies, you have a long, boring hallway full of more teddies that you need to kill before they kill you. Which which can be frustrating since they sometimes come out of nowhere and it takes a bit for you to take your guns out. And believe me, you can't just constantly have them out because there are also a shit ton of security lasers lining the hall. These things are placed at some pretty difficult angles so you'll need all the mobility options you can get. And these things are brutal. Touching one will stun you and take away two health instead of the usual one. Also, you don't get invincibility frames from getting hit by these things. So if there are a bunch of lasers and you accidentally graze one in the air, you'll fall straight down and get hit by the lasers below, almost ensuring your death. And even if you survive, you'll only have two health left, making it really easy for the teddies to pick you off. After that segment that seemingly went on forever, we have another room where you have to pick off a bunch of teddies, and then another room where you do the same thing, but this time you have to hijack a turret to wipe them all out. Getting to the turret is annoying enough, and once you get there, things aren't much better. The aiming controls in the wasp segment were awkward enough, and now you have to use those controls against enemies that actually pose a threat. The teddies are brutal here, especially the bayonet ones that come right up to you, forcing you to aim at an awkward angle to shoot them. All I can say here is that it's okay to get out of the turret to collect more health. It doesn't seem like a good idea, but it helped me last long enough to beat this segment. 
I don't think I would have otherwise. Then you get outside, save Private Rodent, and the next segment is actually kind of fun. It's like the other shooting segments, but actually has an interesting twist. It's an escort mission, only you're the one being escorted. You have to shoot the teddies when they're in your way, but also hide behind Rodent whenever a bomb shows up because he'll shield you from the blast. It's a nice twist that adds a surprising amount to the regular shooting mechanics. The next segment has so little going on it genuinely feels like filler, and then you get to drive around in a tank. This part is tough, but also pretty fun. Basically, you have to shoot down this tower by destroying the supports around it. Of course, you need to drive around the tower to do this, but the bridges are out, so Conker needs to get out and pound them back into place. But you can't leave the tank while the big turret is facing you, otherwise you'll get shot to death. So you need to hide in the tank until it turns away. But the tank's not invincible either. Sure, it can't be hurt by the turret, but the teddies with grenades can and will damage it, so you need to take them out with the tank. It's a lot to remember, but it makes for a fun challenge. But it seems the game realized we were having too much fun, because next is the worst part of the level, the submarine segment. Basically, you have to shoot these submarines with a bazooka that has the same aiming controls as the turret from earlier. What makes this especially bad is that the submarines will periodically go underwater. So by the time you find them, which will probably take a while since you're aimed pretty far away from them by default and the aiming controls suck, you've usually missed your chance. Also, you can't just keep your reticle in the right place and wait for them to resurface because you have to put the bazooka away to dodge the missiles they shoot at you. And as you'd imagine, putting the bazooka away takes time meaning you might just get hit anyway. Especially since you can't see them through your scope due to them being in the air, and the auditory indicators aren't that helpful either. Then we get to the boss, and I'm sorry, I really wanted to like this one. For starters, the concept is awesome, but I even had trouble enjoying that. You see, the voice acting in Conker's Bad Fur Day isn't the best. It makes sense why. Good voice acting wasn't exactly common in this era, and while there are some characters whose less than stellar voices are funny and charming, like with Frankie or Don Weezo, there are also times where the voice acting can make the jokes less funny and take you out of the experience. And the little girl is probably the best example I can think of. Well, her and Von Cripplespeck. Basically, any joke that came from this guy was kind of ruined for me by just how annoying his voice was. But anyway, back to the girl. If she had a better voice actor, I'd probably find her intimidating, funny, or both. As is, though, I just want her to shut up. As for the gameplay, the fight is good in concept. Take out the bear's weapons, shoot the little girl off his hand when she's vulnerable, then shoot him in the back when he goes to pick her up. This is a solid blueprint for a boss fight, but the entire time you have to fight against the tank's controls. I know I just praised an earlier segment with the tank, but moving along a linear path with these controls is a lot easier than moving around an arena and dodging a boss's attacks. And that's just the movement. I've already ranted on how much I hate the turret control, and yep, they apply to the tank too. Now, none of this is too bad, but it still drags down what could have otherwise been a great boss fight. So that's it, right? Of course not, you idiot. You really think the level would end now? No, you have to escape before the place self-destructs. Now, the time limit they give you is actually pretty generous, but it's also not the main thing you have to be worried about here. You see, you're going through that same marathon of a hallway as earlier, only this time the lasers are way, way worse. And just when you think you're done, you have to clear out another room full of teddies. Fun fact, the lasers blocking your exit takes so long to trigger that the first time I got to this point, I couldn't react in time, so Conker went sliding into the lasers and died instantly. Great game design, guys. Once you clear the room of teddies, it's still not over, because you have to make your way down the beach, and this time, there are teddies with fucking bazookas. So yeah, you have to kill them, but you also need to be careful about killing them, because when you're targeting one, another one might come out of nowhere and blow you to pieces, because remember, these things are insta-kill. Then you finally get to the boat, and the general starts talking about how terrible terrible war is, and yeah, he doesn't know the half of it because he didn't need to play this train wreck. Ultimately, this level's main problem is that it clashes with Conker's whole design philosophy. Each level has you doing a wide variety of insane tasks, while this one just has you doing the same thing over and over. The shooting was already done in a similar form in the last level, and even if it wasn't, it still wouldn't be engaging enough to carry virtually 
every segment of a level this long. Keep in mind, I glossed over a couple of parts, so it's even longer than I made it seem. And of course, that doesn't count all the time you'll spend dying from cheap shot after cheap shot from these stupid bears. And that's the other thing about this level. It's not even that crazy compared to the rest of the game. Aside from the boss and a handful of jokes, it's just, oh, look, these teddy bears are Nazis. Isn't that weird? I mean, yeah, for maybe the first segment or two, but it's not enough to carry the whole level. Anyway, this brings us to the final level in the game, and oddly enough, the shortest one. The Heist. The first half of this level is one big reference to the Matrix. The main thing you're gonna be doing is waiting for an opening to do a slow-mo dive and shoot all the security guards. And man, does this get old fast. Maybe it's just a symptom of growing up in the 2000s, but there are a few things that feel more dated to me than referencing the Matrix in this specific way. That, and the jumps aren't really that fun either. They don't really do anything cool with the slow-mo, you're just kind of moving slowly and shooting for a while, then waiting, then moving in slow-mo again. Maybe would have rushed through this part and get it over with, but that led to me getting killed repeatedly, so I took it seriously and got through. Thankfully, it isn't that long, but since you're in such a small space and move forward in such tiny increments, it really feels long. When you're done, a bunch of shit happens. Barry dies, you go into space, and all the bad guys die too, aside from the final boss. Heinrich. This fight is pretty simple, but for whatever reason, I was really bad at it. Maybe I wasn't in the right state of mind, but I just kept messing up the counters despite there only being two attacks, both of which are pretty clearly telegraphed. Plus, the airlock's hitbox can be kind of inconsistent, and I'm not that good at spinning this guy around and throwing him. I'm kind of glad I sucked so hard at this fight, though, because it led to one of my favorite jokes in the game. The warning message in the background will actually get frustrated and insult you if you do too badly at this fight. I didn't laugh out loud, but it consistently put a smile on my face. Finally, you beat Heinrich, and then there's the ending. This might just be the most contentious part of the game. If you like this game, you'll probably see it as brilliant and tragic, and if you don't, you'll probably see it as stupid and unearned. And really, I totally get both perspectives. Overall, I lean more towards thinking it's stupid. The game didn't take itself seriously at all all up to this point, so to all of a sudden throw a serious emotional moment at us feels really out of place and kinda dumb. Like, I'm not against comedies having serious emotional moments, but for that to work, there has to be some element to ground the story, and this game just doesn't have it. The game is as crazy as possible, and like I said, it feels like nothing was taken seriously before now. Also, despite the ending hinging so heavily on Conker's relationship with Barry, we really don't see much of it in the game. The two of them only interact once before the final level, and Barry doesn't even recognize Conker at that point. Also, it seems weird to act like Conker was taking Barry for granted when his entire goal was to get home to her. At the same time, though, there are a few moments where Conker can be seen as taking her for granted, such as staying out at the bar, which isn't that bad, and trying to get with Jugga, which, okay, was pretty scummy of him. Also, you could argue that Conker wasn't that serious about trying to get home, since he keeps getting sidetracked by a bunch of different stuff, most notably, the safe in Bat's tower. However, you could also just chalk that up to the gameplay and overarching story rarely matching up to begin with. I mean, come on, what was Conker trying to accomplish by going inside of an army base or a giant mountain of shit. Although, once again, you could say those decisions tie into Conquer not really being that focused on Barry. In the end, I think the question of whether this disconnect is an intentional design decision or just Luda narrative dissonance is essentially a Rorjak test. You'll see what you want to see. And that's Conquer's Bad Fur Day. Would you be surprised to hear I didn't like it very much? One major point against the game I've kind of been saving for the end is that I really don't think the game is worth playing these days. I know, shocker. But it's not just because of the game's flaws. It's also because of how thoroughly outclassed it is by a lot of modern games. For example, I liked the general idea of this game being a raunchy fever dream where you do insane shit to progress, but the South Park RPGs did that too, were funnier, tied the insanity in with the story, 
better, and were much better games. Having a 3D platformer where you're constantly changing mechanics and playstyles is a fun idea, and it takes two achieved it with more variety, and unlike Conquer, all the mechanics were actually fun. There's definitely an appeal to a game with a largely disconnected story where every level is super different and changes up the rules a considerable amount, and I know this because I'm a huge fan of A Hat in Time, which shakes things up much more drastically in much more interesting ways. Conquer has been praised time and again for its impressive amount of movie references, but they're absolutely dwarfed in both quantity and quality by LEGO City Undercover. An opera singing boss character? Yeah, even that's been repeated, with a wider variety of jokes. Although, yeah, not nearly as much shock value, and the Great Mighty Pooh's probably always going to be more iconic than the Phantom, so this one is kind of a point for Conquer, even if it is a minor one. And sure, we haven't really seen a raunchy 3D platformer since Conquer came out, but Hell Pie is about to change that, and it'll likely be a better game. It's got decades worth of hindsight, and it's not like it has a high bar to clear. All of this shows that Conquer isn't really worth playing these days, because every appealing aspect of it has been done better by another game. However, it also shows just how important Conquer was. It broke a lot of new ground with its raunchy, heavily comedic writing in a medium that hadn't really done anything like it on that scale before. And while it's not as much of a focal point, I'm sure the same can be said about its tendency to mix up the gameplay. It walked, so a lot of these games could run, and that's important in its own way. Yeah, I can't prove all of these games took inspiration from Conquer, although some obviously did, but I still think you can see its influence on comedy-focused games, both with platformers and with other genres. Sure, I may not like this game, but I do respect it as an interesting time capsule of when it came out, and as an important part of video game history. And if you like it, more power to ya. Just don't make me play it again. Also, before I go, I'll rank the levels since that's kind of my thing, and you guys were probably hoping to see me do it. Pooh Mountain is the best. It had the great Mighty Pooh, and everything else was pretty fun too, aside from a minor annoyance at the end. Barn Boys is third. It's a bit basic, but I like the whole vibe of the level, and the worst part was only a little irritating. Spooky is next. Yeah, I was probably angrier with this level than any of the others when I played it, but I think I was just in a bad mood at the time. Aside from the stuff with the worms and a few minor complaints here and there, everything in this level is really well done. Aga Baga is next. Some really frustrating segments, but some fun stuff as well. Then there's the heist. Just a really bare bones final level where half of it is boring and the other half is okay. Second to last is Bat's Tower, Clang's Lair, Nuff Said. Finally, it dead last is the marathon of bullshit, It's War. I am Defofilizer, and do you like this new style of review, or should I stick with the same style I did with stuff like my Beholder and Psychonauts reviews, or should I just alternate based on what fits the game better? Let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time. Now, a big shout out to my patrons who will be up on screen. If you want to be shouted out at the end of my videos, or see videos a day early, be sure to donate there. Beyond that, like, subscribe, share this video, and check out my other videos if you're interested. Bye!